hear a cat in the background. <laughs> I have no power over him. <laughs> I can trap him in his room. That's all I can do. This essay starts with a little background on semiotics. Semiotics is one of those topics in academia that most people tend to shy away from, especially people who aren't in the humanities sector. I get it. As, as someone who is in the humanities sector, even I get a little lightheaded around white people who talk in circles about the most nothing concepts in existence. They are speaking English. <laughs> okay. But to really give you the barest bones on this topic, think of semiotics as the order of operations, right? PEMDAS. When looking at a very, very long equation, you at least have an order of operations to look to so you can start consolidating the smaller parts of the problem to get to a solution. But that assumes that you already know what operations to do to begin with and what those operations symbols look like. You know that this cross sign means to add, this dash means to subtract. You know that numbers shaped like these have an inherent value that is greater than or less than other numbers. Semiotics is the same thing but for sentences, paragraphs, and other such texts, words strung together have an inherent meaning. And the goal of semiotics is to understand the true meaning of any given text. For the purposes of this video, semiotics can also be applied to stories. All stories have units. They can be broken down to neat little segments like an ecosphere. You have an overall narrative, its themes, arcs, chapters, scenes, beats, etc. Breaking these down and analyzing them can lead you to a truth. Notice I didn't say the truth, we'll get to that. For now, like in ecospheres in ecology or orders of operations in mathematics, semiotics in literature have concepts that can seem a little confusing out of context. I'm going deep into explaining all this with a little help from our upcoming topic. Sort of semiotics is just kind of like gonna be our driver here. Now, I know most of my audience on this channel probably have never listened to The Secret Treehouse and those that have are probably my friends. Hi! <laughs> Welcome to the mental illness video essay that is looking a little too educational for its own good. Please, uh, yeah. <laughs> so our helper today is a little 500 chapter Korean web novel called The Omniscient Reader's Viewpoint. Yeah. Note that I'm going to be talking about the web novel specifically, but we'll be showing pictures from the webtoon because well, it's easier for me. I'm not really into the webtoon because I have my own ideas of what these characters look like, but we'll get to that. That said, if you're here and have only read the webtoon, I will be talking about stuff far past where the webtoon currently is way far past. This is 500 chapters. And from before the revisions were done for the international ebook, because the webtoon is taken from that ebook. Anyway, I'm not talking about events that will happen. I'm talking about why they were presented the way they were, what they represent, and how they're connected to certain aspects of the story leading from the beginning to where they are in the story. This is like the, the most basic essence of spoiling you. Can be it any point between the prologues and epilogues. I will I would not care. So this is your last warning. Now let's do a semi primer sort of. I'm not going to explain arcs or like what happens in the story. I'm not gonna go beat by beat because that's too much. So much goes on in the fucking story that it's gonna take me days. <laughs> I'm just going to assume that you, the viewer watching this, are going to have your own form of understanding of what ORV is about and what the main point of it is. So here, the omniscient reader's viewpoint is deceptive. Upon initial reading, it's a transmigrator story. Pause here for the definition of that. A contract worker who basically just lost his job has been transported to the world of the novel he has spent more than 10 years reading. Allegedly, no one knows that this world is a novel except for him. Kim Nokja is the only person who has ever read Three Ways to Survive the Apocalypse, or Tusa, to its ending. But once you get to the proper ending, things begin warping. The omniscient reader's viewpoint isn't just named that for frivolous, it sounds cool sci-fi reasons. You'll want to think that because the world and the universe of Tusa seems sci-fi-ish from the get-go. You have scenario screens, currency, special items, special skills, boss enemies, and boss drops, all that neat transmigrator-esque stuff. You, it sounds like a video game, so it lulls you into this assumption that yeah, this is probably gonna be a little futuristic, right? 
wrong. The omniscient reader's viewpoint is about what it tells you from the title from the start. My name is Doctor. Kim Doctor. My father gave me that name so that I'd become a strong man even if I was on my own. However, thanks to this name that my father gave me, I was simply living as a single man, unremarkable in my loneliness. In short, my life was like this. Kim Dokja, 28 years old, single. My hobby was reading web novels on the subway while going to and from work. This is a novel about reading. It's a novel centered on the act of the desperation for and love for reading. It's a novel that guides you through Dokja's survival and multiple deaths throughout the apocalypse with his favorite characters and the people he's managed to endear himself with. And it is with that that we can now talk about death. When I began reading ORV, I didn't know about this specific concept. Death of the author was familiar to me. Of course, I'm trans. I've lived through the continued debacle about JK Rowling. <laughs> Many a video essayist and grown people who want to keep talking about and making fan works for Harry Potter have touted death of the author like it's the next best thing since lactose free milk. So here's a quick jaunt. Death of the author is a semiotic concept brought about by Roland Barthes some 56 years ago. The idea being that whatever meaning you glean from a text you do not owe to the person who wrote it but to yourself. Your knowledge and the things you learned while reading the text form your understanding of a person's work regardless of their intention. The death of the author states in this conversation between the reader and the text, the author doesn't exist. They may as well be dead. This is why more literary anecdotal demonstrations of death of the author in action include a reader asking a writer if an incident in their work has ever been influenced by XYZ event in history maybe <laughs> in that same writer going huh i was processing the idea of death of the author while reading orv and on kim Nokja's second death began wondering if death of the author is a conversation between the reader and the text then what exactly is death of the audience signaling david kornhaber from the harvard crimson had this to say to kill the audience is to give birth to a new type of person a person who is suddenly aware of their own temporary non-existence in the thoughts that characterize this world. It creates a person who can extend that sublime non-judgment of the darkened theater to the less than sublime world in which we live the rest of our lives. This of course was in the context of theater, which is still applicable for our purposes in semiotics, everything that can be understood as text. So shh. Who's a Starstream is a gigantic streaming platform where constellations get to watch the Kebi channels to see what incarnations are up to. This whole thing is a giant metaphor, of course. Well, the constellations are the Greek chorus to this ongoing tragedy. We as readers are the constellations to the characters' incarnations. All readers are voyeuristic, something Kornhaber mentioned in his article. They feel quick, passionate bursts of emotions for their favorite characters, feel pain, sadness, love, anger. But once the show's over, once you hit happily ever after, these feelings go nowhere. And those same sympathies don't apply to real life people experiencing the exact same hardships. To that, Tomislav Branjevic says, Abolish the artist, the audience, and art, for it abolishes the space of freedom and introduces the censorship of art at the level of thought, idea. Orvi in itself is the act of killing the audience over and over. By turning Tusa into a reality, there can no longer be a reader because Dokja is no longer reading Tusa, he's living in it. This is where the video game concept begins turning its head. One of the best examples of a reader affecting a story as it plays out is through video games. I've seen a lot of people compare ORV to Undertale, and while that contains a kernel of truth, that's kind of a misconception of what ORV is trying to do with its version of Death of the Audience, or at least it gives you an idea of questions to ask. Faye Seidler, in their article about all works Davy Readen, gives us this diagram when talking about intent and interpretation. About Death of the Audience, they said, It suggests that we remove the text from the equation. It isn't the story that dies. What dies is the ability for the audience to perceive the work outside of the author's demands. The story becomes the author having a conversation with you directly. Undertale, Seidler ventures further, is a very literal understanding of this as it strongly pushes against the player character and the player themselves when doing a No Mercy run. Seidler also gives the example of self-help books playing into Death of the Audience, as the readers of most self-help books seek guidance and don't feel weird when the author addresses them or their experiences directly. In ORV, Kim Nokja is not helpless. 
in most situations, the guy has a backup plan because he knows Tusa like the back of his hand. He has a route he's taking and he's frustrated that it seems that everything he's doing is being met with resistance. It begins with Yu Jung Hyuk's lack of cooperation and the company's lack of trust in him. When he wins Jung Hyuk's faith in the company's loyalty, the Starstream starts pushing back with probability. An in universe status check on whether the scenario was maintaining suspension of disbelief. When he outsmarts the Starstream system, the fourth wall, his exclusive skill, begins refusing to cooperate and tries to actively sabotage him by sending him revisions to Tusa. When he begins leaning on his teammates for survival and starts ignoring Tusa's canon, the constellations in Dokkevi start tamping down at him. So it seems the world of Tusa is actively resisting Dokkevi's plans to reach his desired ending. Tusa, made to keep him alive, is trying to pull him back from what is functionally a final swan song that would end with him having nothing to do but to accept other stories he receives, passive in his readings and having nothing else to say or bend to his will. He may as well be dead. Before, Doctor had his own thoughts, feelings, and interpretations of Tusa, almost to the detriment of his companions because his understanding of them, though high, means jack shit if he's not seriously engaging with them as people. And this is where Fanon comes in. Fanon is, well, it's not entirely too complicated a concept, but for the sake of the flow, we'll get specific. Fanon is fandom canon. It is the widely known and accepted interpretation of a character to the point that all fans deem this to be the norm. Whether or not this aligns with canon is irrelevant. No author is engaging with fan fiction, after all. Yu Jung Hyuk, the protagonist of Three Ways to Survive in the Apocalypse, has gone through nearly 2,000 regressions to get to the ending. He's lived nearly 2,000 apocalypses, has seen several companions and family members die in front of him over a thousand times already. Since Dokja is our narrative character, our understanding of Jung-hyuk is tilted slightly towards Dokja's personal headcanons and thoughts about Jung-hyuk. This is not a normal thing to do to a real-life person, so if you were aware from the get-go that Dokja is unreliable, this might seem a little unnerving. <laughs> Multiple times, before we even get a grasp of Jung-hyuk's personality or the gravity of his role in Tusa from the way Dokja understands it, he's called the psychopath, he's treated like a means to an end, he's frustrating to work with and unreasonable, he's choosy, arrogant, smarmy, he's cool and collected, too handsome, too skilled, he's simultaneously stupid and smart because he has a knowledge base about the apocalypse above most people's scope, but he refuses to trust anyone else with that knowledge. Truthfully, you'll only ever understand Jung-hyuk as Tusa's protagonist when you look at Secretive Plotter, the canon Jung-hyuk, who hadn't even been introduced to the reader. Plotter set out to become a constellation and try and meet his reader. The shape of him is clear by his main core of companions. This is technically the 999th main core of companions, but it's his now. <laughs> he owns it. The soldier Lee Hyun Sung, the grieving Lee Ji Hye, the reckless Kim Nam Moon, and the vindictive Yuriel. There are many, very many other versions of the main core. A few regression turns make Lee Sol Lua to be one of the main companions. A few include Shin Yu Sung, but in most of them, and in the one Dok Jia loved the most, it's these four. From these four, you can get a picture of the kind of person Jung Hyuk really is, no matter how shoddily written Tusa was. Han Tzu Yong was still a very good writer. Lee Yun Sung is a soldier who has a difficulty adjusting to life outside the military. He lives by the manual and feels lost without it. This makes him susceptible to deceit and led around by smarter people who seem to have their wits about them. In the face of the world ending and the lack of direction, he first puts up walls, then warns off enemies by turning himself into a weapon. Whether he uses it for protection or for revenge is more easily represented by Uriel. Uriel is a little confusing. She's still a scary fuck off angel who can literally burn you alive just by standing there, but she's also fundamentally a righteous being. In Jung Hyuk's teams, she more or less would adopt Jung Hee Won's role vindictive, making quick judgment calls and loyal to a fault. She's also got a bit of a temper and potty mouth. <laughs> Lee Jihye also has the same temperament, but she's 16, she's allowed. Jihye is driven by grief. She freezes when she remembers having to kill her best friend to survive. She contemplates killing herself to get rid of that guilt. On top of this, she's eager to learn to adapt to this new environment, finding the silver lining in everything while trying to adjust, like seeing the star stream and the scenarios as a game. 
Kim Nam Won always gets pinned down as the first to die in Dok Ja's timeline because he's allegedly there to represent Dok Ja's younger self. Which is, it's a read. I know it's from like Journey to the West arc, but ugh. His role in Tusa and Jung Hyuk's core team is much like Hyun Sung's, but in sharper contrast. Namun has the potential for both good and evil, depending on which way you guide him. Because really, he's just an impressionable teenager? Jung Hyuk always keeps Namun on his team, not because he's actually a good noodle, but because he knows Namun can learn. And once he learns, he can be damn near competitive with teammates that have been there since the start. So from that list, you can infer Yoo Jung Hyuk's role as a character in Tusa. He was made to show the reader, Dong Ja, that kindness takes practice. That you can find yourself in the people around you and that you affect them just the same, making you inseparable due to those bonds. He was made to show that utility is not the end-all be-all of a relationship. Give everyone a chance to learn, even yourself. Be generous. Don't let your guilt and resentments shape your future or keep you in place. If you have hardened yourself against your fear of directionlessness, that's okay. Find your moral compass, your pack, and stick to them. You'll survive longer and a lot less lonelier if you lean on those who trust you and those you trust. The scarce few times we are put in Jung Hyuk's perspective without Dr. Ja's lens of bias, this list of traits is embodied throughout. When he launches himself up into space to try and get to other world lines in that last desperate bid to save Dr. Ja, Jung Hyuk expresses deep insecure vulnerability. He has no companions on this ship, no author. It's just him and the blank void of space and the hope that maybe this will turn out. Why did I come this far? There were moments when his purpose would become blurry, uncertain. He came this far to carry out his mission, to deliver a story to the reincarnated Kim Dok Ja, to revive the Kim Dok Ja his companions remembered. Why though? He still had something he simply had to ask Kim Dok Ja. That's why. But what was the question? In a world where the scenarios have come to an end, what should he do to continue living on? That's right. That's what he wanted to ask Kim Dokja. Because that guy knew everything. As people, we aren't offered a clear cut remedy to our own inadequacies. Reality is much stranger than fiction, because while we can make worlds where people exist with a purpose and a message to deliver, reality doesn't offer us that same cushion. Tusa becoming a reality has us and Dokja himself facing the fact that Yoo Jung Hyuk's lack of direction and vast amount of drive is a steep, steep problem to face when you're trying your best to keep everyone in the story alive. Because Tusa is a tragedy. Yoo Jung Hyuk is suicidal. The quirkiness of ORV's setting of a contract worker being put into his favorite novel runs its course when the reality of Jung Hyuk's situation is presented the way it is. The Starstream isn't fun and games. There are real costs, consequences doggedly tailing every action. And Jung Hyuk, who has the best chance out of anyone to survive it, has been living this reality for over 2,000 lifetimes for the sake of finally reaching Dok Ja by himself. He is tired and lonely. He is in dire need for any companion. Jung Hyuk never once defies Tusa's narrative throughout ORV. When it comes to Dok Ja's rescue, when he discovers the truth behind his own existence, when he actively tries to defy Dok Ja's understanding of him, he is dooming himself further. The only time he's ever defied his narrative is when he committed himself to being plotter and peeling himself away from Tusa's narrative, which becomes moot in the end when he comes to his own ending with, again, his companions. He and Tusa, in essence, were made to make sure Dok Ja is kept alive, and that purpose will keep him chugging along the narrative train ride until it's made certain that Dok Ja isn't going to kill himself. And the reason for Jung Hyuk's general lack of philosophical and semiological agency here is part and parcel with our last topic. Quantum superposition. Just stay with me here. Come back. Come on. Give me a chance. Okay. Quantum superposition is a concept of quantum physics that is more philosophical than it has any right to be. It's when atoms split and simultaneously hit and not hit an object on impact. And really, the only way of actually having a measure or whether or not it hit is if you yourself observe it. 
you would end up with a conclusion and an observation, but you will have irreversibly changed the course of the atom itself by doing so. After all, to perceive something is to interact with and connect with it and affect it. The concept is just as true for atoms as it is for most everything in life. The idea of quantum superposition is often understood through the more popular concept of Schrodinger's cat, where the act of checking to see if the cat is either dead or alive in its box with radioactive materials will lead to equal chances of it being dead or alive. Not checking will maintain its status of being both dead and alive. I am not talking out of my ass here, by the way. <laughs> this is still relevant. I did research. I don't know if that's correct. Um, do not correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just sorry. Han Soyoung wrote both Tusa and ORV in an intense desperation spanning world lines and timelines to keep Kim Dokja alive. Dokja is her only reader, and the only reader that ever really mattered to her. He saw her work and connected to it on a personal level. He gave it his most scathing comments and loving compliments and ultimately judged it, but not her. The trouble with this is that the existence of the novels both condemns and saves Dokja from death, and by keeping the text within the equation, she and Dokja will never meet in the middle. The text separates the author from her reader. When you remove the text from this conversation, both of them cease to exist. They will only ever know each other through the story and will only ever be acquainted with each other through it. Personally, this is what I see as the true tragedy of Omniscient Reader's viewpoint. The wall standing between a writer and the reader she wants to dedicate her craft to. This is evident in the similarities between Han Soyoung and Lee Seok-yong, Dokja's mother who went to prison and wrote a book that both condemned and saved Dokja from scrutiny. Soyoung and Seok-yong are both writers who had fed Dokja a narrative to save him from himself. If Dokja had just believed that his father's death and mother's incarceration were both his fault, the guilt would have killed him. On a similar level, if Dokja had believed that the world had ended to keep him alive, he would have killed himself to save everyone. Despite the efforts of these stories existing to keep him alive, they both ultimately ended up killing him, both literally and metaphorically in the sense of death of the audience. While he buys both lies and misdirections, he still manages to find a way to blame himself for the continued suffering of those around him and of himself. Let's take several steps back though, because personally there's something more interesting here than Dokja's self-imposed annihilation. From a meta-narrative standpoint, the assumption that the world is ending because of Kim Dokja is correct. As the reader of the story, his goal is to witness how the main ensemble survives and triumphs throughout the apocalypse. But as long as he keeps reading, they are never going to find peace. Scenes and scenarios are supposed to have conflict, are supposed to serve a narrative purpose. All of them. Whether it's to share more about a character or to see that they develop a skill or to resolve a hang-up of theirs. This is why his companions level up faster when they're not with him. <laughs> it's not because of- it's not because Yoo Jung-hyuk is better than him, it's because he's not looking at them. They are not having a shitty time because he's not seeing them. While he's not looking, he has to assume that they are both improving and experiencing more hardships. Schrodinger's cat. But ORV's narrative insists that in order for the world to stay alive and for the epilogue to continue past its main conclusion, the reader needs to keep reading. Who is suffering then in this epilogue he's reading into existence? Him? If the scenarios are over, whose conflict needs resolving? This conundrum exists because ORV never frames it from the inverse. In order for a story to continue and for a reader to read it, it would have to be written first. Reading is a secondary function. You can't read what's never been written. Omniscient reader's viewpoint is a paradox of perception. It tricks you into placing blame on any one person for the existence of this tragedy. Han Soyoung wrote the story. Yoo Jung Hyuk lived that story. And I read that very story. And that's how this world barely managed to reach its completion. Dokja can't have been a reader if Soyoung never wrote the story, who wouldn't have written the story if she hadn't wanted him to keep reading. The reason why ORV's narrative insists then that Dokja has to keep reading for the epilogue to exist is because Han Soyoung still wants him to read, even if the act of reading actively harms him and his companions. Because if he's not reading, then the bond between them quite literally doesn't exist. Omniscient Reader's viewpoint is very much symbolic. A lot of its statements are literal and declarative. Its scenarios are straightforward, 
but it all adds up in sentiment and meaning the further in you get. This is why I had that lengthy talk about semiotics up front. This video is just one of many interpretations of ORV out there from the millions of other readers who love this story. Because of its length and density, ORV can have some so many different meanings that you can take to mean many other different things. This is why I said that semiotics goal is to find a truth, not the truth, a truth. Tangentially, what actually gets brought up in the epilogue? But it's less about death of the author and authorial intent and more, t more to talk about the morning diaries, which alluded and implied that ORV was Han Suyong's morning diary. But really, okay, if you're not into reading ORV as a semiotic thought experiment, this would have been one hell of a lengthy video essay to sit through. <laughs> there is a lot here I left out, believe it or not. There's Peace Land's Asuka Ren, Nam Go Min Young's existence in Tuza's narrative on what her purpose may have been, the role of the constellations. Dokja actually has a similar main core of people that are like 999's core companions that are indicative of his character. But instead of people from the company, it's actually his first four constellations. If you want to know more about that, you can ask me in the comments, please. <laughs> Listen, this is a 500 chapter web novel and I'll be real with you. Just Yuhan Kim, they're enough to fill out about 13 pages worth of an essay. I think I'm fine if I cut it off here. This is 4,000 words. I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> so... Thank you for sticking around. Um, some updates, I think. Um, I think there are updates. I don't know. Okay, so I know this is a bit much to drop after nearly a year of hiatus, but I think I'm allowed since life is a little hectic. I'm still in college. My schedule's a little more fucked, and there's some, some trouble brewing at home, so bear with me. As always, if you like that and the work I do, consider supporting me through Kofi. I do have a project coming up, but I don't know how well I'm going to like uphold writing it when I have so many side projects I want to work on first. <laughs> but yeah, um, I also actually already had an episode about ORV in the Secret Treehouse. So if you haven't listened to that, the link will be flashing up here or down in the description. Sources will be down there as well. Um, thank you so much for sticking around and especially, oh my god, thank you to Aline and Danny for continuing to support me monthly despite the very, very lengthy hiatus and I'm not even like updating you guys. I'm sorry. Anyway, so as always, take care. Ingat lahat. Bye.